So this brings us to our final presenter, Danny Thomas, Regional Director of CBRE Agribusiness. Um, Danny and his team have valued some of the largest agricultural, horticultural and aquaculture assets in Australia. Danny and his team have undertaken major transactions with real values between $250 million and a billion dollars across these industries. So I welcome Danny to the podium to present um, his um, talk on foreign investment in Australian agriculture. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak today. Seems to be my bit to speak between people and food. So I'll make sure I don't hold you up too long. As you can see, I'm a lover of food. <laughs> and that's why I like to work in food and agribusiness. Uh, it would also be remiss of me not to disclose the fact that, uh, and whilst they might not know it, the previous three speakers are all clients of ours. Um, in relation to Cargill, our global corporate services platform provides real estate services to Cargill all over the world. I'm not sure if you knew that, Philippa. Good. Um, uh, also undertake some work for uh, some of the organisations that Mr McKillop's involved with in terms of valuations and advisory work. And I'm pleased to say, and I'm not quite sure if you know, but we've been doing some work with the VFF recently as well. So uh, all the uh, conflicts are disclosed, so as everyone knows. A little bit about CBRE quickly. Um, CBRE is certainly not a name which is synonymous with agriculture in Australia, where the new kid's on the block, but it's important to uh, tell everybody in the room we're the world's largest real estate services firm. We employ 44,000 people worldwide. Uh, and because of the flow of institutional investment into agriculture in Australia and New Zealand, um, the business has made uh, a very rational decision to say that they want to be here to be able to provide services to uh, the direct investors and the alternate pots of money. Uh, we're already servicing their needs in commercial real estate to make sure we're able to do the same in agribusiness investment. Uh, the reason we've done that is because uh, one of the things they're concerned about is the fact that uh, um, they haven't been able to get institutional grade advice for the institutional grade investments that they want to make. So we're trying to make a concerted effort to improve the level of reporting and the level of service we give to those people. They're after data rich assets and if there's a criticism of, uh, of our industry it's that historically we haven't been able to give them that data. So if we're going to activate foreign investment we have to do a better job of providing them the information that they need. Foreign ownership in farmland and gateway assets is a politically charged and vexed topic. And uh, we've heard some of that today. We've heard some robust debate. Uh, it's something that's debated heavily in the media. I have to say one of my frustrations is, um, unfortunately, and I suppose it's a function of what we need to do to sell papers or what uh, the media needs to do to sell papers, so much of it is less than positive. Uh, that creates a, a bundle of difficulties when you're trying to encourage investment to come to the country. I think it's important to note, and Philippa touched on this, uh, we're in a global market. Um, if you want to draw investment into your market, and I think it's well established based on uh, John's discussion that we are in a capital constrained environment, we do need some capital if we're going to take advantage of the opportunity that's in front of us. Uh, in a global environment where we're competing, we need to present ourselves and sell ourselves uh, and offer that capital um, a safe haven, if you like, a place that it wants to go and a place where it's not so difficult to invest. Now, uh, we've got some distinct advantages in Australia in terms of the way we're viewed uh, in relation to sovereign risk and uh, stable government, but I think we do run the risk uh, of missing out on what this great opportunity is if we make it too difficult for these people to invest because uh, the money's a little bit like uh, uh, water down a pipe, if you like, or water in an irrigation bay. Uh, it'll find its way, uh, based on gravity, to the easiest place. And uh, if we make things too hard, it won't come here, simple as that. I'd have to say, uh, having staff and officers in New Zealand and Australia, and notwithstanding the uh, OIO, uh, effectively New Zealand's equivalent to FERB, I think New Zealand are well in front of us at the present time and have got a distinct first mover advantage in terms of the amount of uh, inbound capital that they've been able to attract and what the, uh, the bounce to their economy and the advantages they've been able to achieve have been. They're the political statements. So uh, now we'll get on with the facts. So in relation to today, uh, I want to focus on the factual basis in, uh, uh, encouraging that investment thematic. I want to talk about who's in the market. Some of that's a little bit of a duplication of what Philippa went over. 
Uh, I want to know, uh, I want to explain who we understand the active acquirers of farmland are in Australia. We're going to talk about farmland. We're not going to talk about post farm gate stuff. Where does the money come from? What are they looking for? Um, what commodities are favoured? I think that's important. Um, what geographies? And what does a vendor need to do to attract foreign capital? So we think there's an opportunity out there uh, for people who are full up on debt um, to attract some of this capital. And we're seeing quite a bit of co-investment occurring. A lot of it's beneath the radar. And, uh, and that's a good way home both for the capital because they get good management uh, and for, um, for the producer because they've got someone that's uh, not as uncaring as rapacious as debt that needs to be serviced all the time. They've got someone as a partner who can go the journey with them. Foreign investment in farmland should not be confused with acquisitions for competing land use and land use change. So again, one of the things that concerns me is, uh, particularly through the mining boom, we heard a whole lot about uh, farms being acquired by foreign interests, and there was a lot of Sino interests that were acquiring them as well. They weren't motivated by food security, they weren't motivated by uh, land ownership or preservation of capital. That was quite distinctly mining and energy. Um, I think we've probably come through the back end of that cycle now. We're still seeing some knock-ons from coal acquisitions, particularly in Queensland and the Northern Territory, but for the most part that activity started to wane. I don't want to talk about that, I think that's a separate phenomenon. Uh, the motivations of those purchases are quite distinct from the motivations of parties seeking exposure to soft commodities and food production. And, and I, I want to very clearly focus on the latter. Is it changing? You've got me worried, John. The source of funds for foreign investment are typically pension funds. So pension funds, and that's what they would be referred to overseas, our superannuation funds, if you like, insurance funds, endowment funds, uh, sovereign wealth funds, John touched on those, ultra high net worths and family offices and trading houses and corporates. Now, I'm going to go back to basics a little bit here, not because I want to tell anybody in the room how to suck eggs, but I think it's important to understand what the various sources of capital are and what they're trying to achieve. So in terms of the pension funds, are obviously a major source of foreign investment capital worldwide. And the good thing is they typically take a long-term view. And the example referred to as Westchester in John's presentation is TIAA CREF. Um, TIAA is a greater than $500 billion uh, pension fund in the United States. And in many respects, they pioneered direct investment in farmland, initially in the States, and now obviously have significant investments in Australia. Um, they're very publicly doing things like, uh, you know, their acquisition of Prime Ag. Um, I would guesstimate, and I've got no factual basis for saying it, they've probably got 800 or 900 million dollars invested in Australia now, and they're intending, as I understand it, to continue to make investments in Australia in the long term. Uh, they developed a fund last year, which I think is called the Global Ag Properties Trust, which uh, has encouraged other investment in their own fund as well. So a lot of the money they invest in Australia now is not just their own, it's also from a group of uh, Canadian and European uh, pension and sovereign funds as well. John talked a bit before about the FERB rules. As a consequence of that, uh, notwithstanding the fact that Westchester and Tia creates a pension fund and wouldn't normally uh, suffer the FERB rules as in the zero threshold, because they have uh, some sovereign wealth in their pooled fund now, every one of their acquisitions goes through FERB in the same way as the Hassad ones do. Insurance funds. Insurance funds are largely uh, misunderstood, I think, and probably not particularly transparent because the way they would invest would be through funds of funds or special purpose funds. Uh, again, to declare the conflict, uh, CBRE Global Investors, which is an investment arm of, of CBRE, handles the investments for a lot of insurance funds around the world uh, in terms of what we do in direct property and alternatives. Um, they obviously want to inv invest their reserves in assets uh, that are secure and they want to preserve capital for future claims and that's one of the reasons that they're attracted to uh, agriculture. Uh, you, you'll rarely, very rarely see them identified as an investor but they're certainly major investors in ag. Endowment funds, they're obviously a major source of foreign capital worldwide as well. One of the great examples of an active endowment fund in agricultural investment worldwide is the Harvard University uh, Endowment Fund known as the Harvard Management Company. That's a greater than $30 billion endowment fund uh, and that's, that's been set up by the alumni to provide financial returns to the Harvard Uni, so that helps fund some of what Harvard Uni does, uh, both from an operational and capital perspective. Um, they really did pioneer a lot of this stuff in Timberlands early days, and now they're looking at direct investments in agriculture as well. You know, a lot of their activity would be um, masked, if you like, either through a fund or through a special purpose vehicle, 
And um, uh, needless to say, in Australia and New Zealand, they're very, very active across a, a, a broad group of commodities. Just a quick check, sovereign wealth funds. Sovereign wealth funds, again, obviously a major source of capital world, worldwide. They typically take a long-term view as well. We hear a lot about their motivations being uh, food security. You hear CIC mentioned in every forum uh, that you go to, China Investment Corp. Uh, I'd prefer to look at the guys that have probably been in the game a bit longer, if you like. Um, people like the AP funds, the buffer funds out of Sweden. Uh, they've been active investors in agriculture in Australia and New Zealand for some time. And importantly, they invest across a group of commodities. So they look at grazing land, timberlands and dairy farms. Um, uh, again, their activities probably aren't as public as someone like Westchester. Uh, they do it through their country manager or their various country managers. Um, and uh, I, I won't go into who they are, but suffice to say they're very active and they continue to want to invest in agriculture. Ultra high net worths and family offices. Their motivations are often around preservation of capital and making defensive investments. And a couple of the good examples would be Sir Michael Hintz, um, who has his money through, uh, invested through growth farms, and I imagine a lot of people in the room have heard of growth farms before, uh, and the Rawsing family, the beneficiaries of the Tetra Pak fortune. Um, you know, they've made significant investments across Australia and New Zealand as well. And the last people that we sort of talk about who have been less inclined to go up country and actually buy production, but who have probably done it more uh, since those food shops that Philippa talked about than any time before, are people like Olam, Shandong Rui, and I'm not going to try and pronounce the last one, we'll just call it HFA. Um, those guys, as a risk mitigant, uh, have made a conscious decision to go and buy some production. Sonny Verhazy at Olam, if anybody wants to Google it and watch his presentation talking about food price inflation. I think that'll be instructive for the people in the room in so much as uh, you'll understand what their motivations are. Now, paradoxically, or perhaps perversely, Olam as a company have been smashed um, by the market for doing exactly that. So in more recent times, they've sought to uh, lighten the load in terms of lighten the balance sheet uh, and take some, of that, uh, take some of that stuff off book. And the most recent way they did that in Australia was to sell their almond investments in Northern Victoria on a sale and lease back to Laguna Bay. Uh, so you might have seen some of that in the paper. Um, again, Sonny Verhazy still maintains that um, you know, they do want to have some production exposure as a risk mitigant. And uh, if you look at other companies around the world, uh, Ferrero Group would be another good example. Ferrero Group have activated that $70 million development on a property that used to be called Delapool on the Murrumbidgee uh, in New South Wales. That's all about growing their own hazelnuts. And the reason is they're concerned about what their hazelnut supply is going to be going forward. So you, I think one of the things you will see, particularly if we do continue to have um, a, lot of, a lot of volatility in markets by commodity, is that some of these corporates will take the opportunity either to go and do a direct investment themselves or do a co-invest with somebody with an offtake. Uh, I think we're going to see more and more of that. What are they looking for? Almost without fail, these investors are looking for data-rich assets. They want to see not just long-run production um, records, but they want to see long-run financial records. One of the things we confront when we're talking to a vendor, uh, or for that matter, if we're doing evaluation uh, for one of these people, is getting information on what the finances are. And I suppose one of the reasons that uh, people are reticent to give us financial information, particularly if it's been uh, uh, perhaps two or three years ago in that, in that decade-long drought, is it doesn't paint a particularly good picture. That's fine. These people are sophisticated. They understand that. They understand what the implications are of uh, debt, uh, of uh, volatility in commodity prices and climate. Uh, I always encourage the vendors to lead rather than follow and make sure that they don't just focus on production data, that they give some financial data as well where they can. Um, one of the things that we also confront is that there's probably been a lack of sophistication. Some of our uh, very large farmers who are becoming vendors, as some of those push and pull factors really come to hit home and they get older and there's no succession, uh, is that they've, they've become very, very big because they're exceptionally good farmers. Um, uh, they've pulled the right rein at the right time and they've had a great gut feel about what things to do and when. But unfortunately, sometimes there's not the rigour um, behind there for, from a financial perspective. They're very, very good at maths, make no mistake, but, but for inbound capital to get a good handle on what they're doing. So uh, what we're finding more and more is that if we're going to set one of those things up for sale and we're going to target an institutional investor, 
we, we might be spending three months, six months, we might be bringing some of the consultants in the room in to help us uh, put the data together so as we can present it in its best light. They want high quality properties that don't require a lot of further development capital. There's very little appetite out there at an institutional level to undertake further development. Uh, they really want the roll gold article. That's quite distinct from the private equity stuff. There's, there's private equity money out there uh, that's got a higher appetite for risk. Uh, in the River Rooney, you're seeing some people take the opportunity to buy uh, land because of a, a, a value mismatch, if you like, land and water and the opportunity to roll that into cotton and development. I'd have to say the, the arbitrage opportunity, the gap there is closing fairly quickly if you look at what's happened to the price of general security water and the kick in land values there probably in the last six months. But there certainly has been that opportunity um, to do an arbitrage and, 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 uh, and attract some value and pick up what I'd call a profit and risk. Um, but frankly, in terms of institutional money, they want, it, they want all the heavy lifting to have been done. They want sound counterparties, uh, lessees or co-investors, but lessees in particular. So we are talking before about the Westchester model. The Westchester model is largely, well, it's supposed to be a largely passive model if you look at what they do elsewhere in the world. They typically like to invest and have uh, lessees. Um, and the longer, the longer the term of the lessee, the better. Um, unfortunately, at the present time, they've probably got an overweight into operations rather than lessees. There's, there's a lack of good lessees there for them. And in terms of the people in this room, the smart up and comers, I think one of the great opportunities for you is uh, if you've got some country and you're looking for a bit of leverage, if you're trying to chase a bit of scale, rather than taking on an enormous amount of debt, if you've got people like Westchester in the market that you can lease land from on long terms, um, uh, notwithstanding the fact there's probably still a bit of a disconnect about what they want as a return and what you can afford to pay, um, uh, that, that'll be a great opportunity for you going forward as well. Uh, but they're also looking for sound counterparties of co-investors. So in terms of uh, uh, some of the capital, um, Ducks and Asset Manager would probably be a good example out of Singapore. Uh, they they want to go the journey with someone. They want to be either a 49 or 51% shareholder. Uh, they want everybody to have skin in the game. Uh, so as there's sort of an alignment of values and they have a lot of trouble and what they spend all their time doing their DD on is, is finding the co-investor, finding the, the person that's capitalised enough that they can be that 49 or 51% uh, and that's got the smarts, if you like, got the, the logical rigour, uh, got the governance to go the journey with uh, their institutional funds. They're also looking for experienced country managers. There's a criticism of us at the moment uh, and a lot of this, unfortunately, I think is the hangover from uh, the, the, the binge of MIS from 2000 to 2008. Um, a lot of the country managers that are around at the moment, and this is in no way a, a, a criticism or a reflection of them, a lot of the country managers that are around, the people that have that experience have been born out of MIS. And to uh, discard themselves of the, uh, uh, the detritus of that, if you like, um, because no, none of us are Teflon coated, has been a bit difficult. So. Um, yeah, the more and more country managers we can get in the place, uh, the more capability we have uh, from a funds and, and asset management point of view, the better off we're going to be as well. If they're seeking, in, seeking production exposure, which is not all of them, there's only a small part of the market that's looking for that, uh, investors are drawn to experienced management and stable workforces. And, and look, I haven't asked John about this, but I imagine, and he'll kick me in the pants afterwards if that's not right, that one of the attractions for Shandong Rui uh, would have been uh, the Brimblecombe and, and uh, his team, if you like, at Covey. And I, I understand, and again, I'm happy to be corrected, that there haven't been significant changes to the management team that they took on when they took on Covey Station. So uh, I think that continuity of management is probably a strength. Uh, they also are attracted to properties that enjoy strong paths to market in relation to their commodities. So um, as you would expect, uh, where they can buy a going concern rather than just a real property, and the going concern is benefited by contracts that uh, go to major processes or supermarkets, they're very, very comfortable with that because they feel that really underwrites the business, uh, it makes the business bankable and they can understand and get their head around the numbers. Commodities. Uh, in terms of the major commodities they're drawn to, we've talked a lot about uh, uh, Westchester, Warakiri, uh, the Lawson Grain Fund, um, uh, Hassad, all of those guys are chasing grains and oils. Uh, and what we see, it's quite interesting, when a scale asset becomes available, almost without fail, all four of those guys butter up for it. Um, and it's interesting to see them push each other along um, to try and 
buy those properties because those scale opportunities come along so infrequently. Um, while we're talking about who comes from where, um, you know, the Lawson Grain Fund out of Paraguay is the same as um, out of Macquarie is the same as the Paraguay Fund. Obviously, it's a pooled fund, a lot of foreign money in that. Uh, the Warakiri Fund is supported by the Retail Employee Superannuation Trust. So it's all domestic money. So we've got a domestic fund going head to head with uh, domestic domicile, but foreign money. We've got Hassad, which is sovereign wealth money. Um, who was the last one? Anyone remember? Warakiri, oh, Westchester, Westchester, which is just straight pension money. And I think it's, it's instructive to look at the four of those and look at what the four pools of money are, and yet they all chase the same scale assets. They're, they're very formulaic in terms of what works for them. The other commodity uh, that I think is often forgotten about, and I think it's one that's got a very, very bright future, and you're starting to see a bit of a kick now in more media about it with, uh, with Select Harvest and OLAM, is Edible Nuts. Um, edible Nuts, if you look at it worldwide, uh, is not done at scale across most of the nut types. Uh, if you look at hazelnuts, for example, most come out of Turkey, and most of the farmers in Turkey are on two or three hectares, and it's still very much a cottage industry. So that actually creates a, a whole bundle of risks for a group like Ferrero that take out 60 or 70 per cent of the, the hazelnuts every year for their Nutella and Ferrero Rocher type products. Um, and so that's why they're concerned about how they can build a scale business in, in nuts. If you look at almonds, there's a lot of challenges in the, in the traditional almond growing areas in California, the San Joaquin Valley, in terms of uh, water going forward, climactic issues. And so there's a lot of capital coming into Australia looking not just to buy our existing almond plantations, but to actually activate greenfield developments. And I think that's a really positive thing, particularly when you consider that an investment in, uh, in something like almonds is uh, six or seven years before you get any return, and it's probably got a break-even point of 11 or 12 years. So the money that's coming in to invest in that is none of this short-term money that John was talking about before where they're marked to market all the time. They understand that they need to go through the J curve and come out the other end. The last one's cotton and irrigated cropping, and we've seen obviously a lot of activity in that. Um, again, I think it's instructive to look at what's happening in the in the Southern Riverina at the moment around hay, uh, the activation by Auscott of a new gin, uh, the investment of Tandow in South Farm, uh, what's occurring there with a group called Wealth Check, um, again Westchester buying uh, Cobram, a uh, syndicate buying Gundaline, and other scale markets coming on the market. If you go and look at the kick in general security water valves. Uh, what's happening in groundwater valuations as well in terms of uh, people sucking those resources in. We're going to see some really, really big developments in the Riverina and I think that's really exciting. Um, you've also got another cotton gin proposed at Carathor, which is in some ways underwritten by Louis Dreyfus. So um, very exciting to see those guys uh, activating those developments. Geographies. I'd have to say, uh, notwithstanding some big transactions across in the West, uh, almost without fail, uh, the, big, the big institutional leaks are coming to the East Coast. Um, and uh, the major beneficiaries of that, not to labour the point of the Riverina uh, and the border rivers of New South Wales and Queensland. Um, and, and that really makes sense if you think about it, if you think about the indefeasi indefeasibility of, uh, of the water products and the security that people get in those in terms of irrigation and the physical size of the cadaster. To go to John's point again, um, you know, the money's really drawn to those very, very large holdings. If, if they've got to go and aggregate small holdings and put Humpty Dumpty back together again, uh, there's a big erosion in value in terms of um, every one of those small holdings has got a house on it, every one of those small holdings has uh, a very um, old infrastructure and most of it's got to be no pun and bulldoze. So rather than going through that process and trying to put Humpty Dumpty together and, and build scale, they'd rather go and pay up for scale assets that are uh, developed or near developed to their maximum. Attracting foreign capital, becoming investment ready. So w one of the challenges we have when we're educating our clients about these things is, is what they need to do to attract the capital. And this is, this is a really important part of the equation in my mind uh, because I don't think a lot of people realise that there's some work to be done if you want to get the best out of um, foreign investment or any investment in agriculture for that matter. You've really got to look at your structure. You know, the Australian tax law being what it is uh, and the way we've traditionally done succession doesn't necessarily align with, uh, with being able to receive inbound capital. So it's very, very important that uh, you take some advice and look at your structure. Uh, the next thing is governance. Uh, yeah, it's a major issue for any institutional investor where they're dealing with pooled uh, superannuation funds or whatever else, just to be going and dealing with, going and dealing or investing with uh, Joe Bloggs, Danny Thomas or, or whoever. Um, 
they're going to want to see some governance there. That's one of the great things that, that uh, AGCAP bring to uh, the investments with um, Shannon Rui and others. And obviously the logical one's management. And I heard David Williams at the Food Forum talk about management as being the gaping wound in, in Australian agriculture, and frankly it is. Lachlan pointed it out before as well. That, that's the big opportunity, I think, for a lot of the people in this room. So those of you who aspire um, to get into agriculture at the pointy end, or what I, what I consider the pointy end, that's the great opportunity for you. You don't have to go and be an owner necessarily. Uh, and uh, I don't think you need to be frightened about foreign investment. I think foreign investment is going to create a whole lot of opportunities for you people uh, in management. Selling to foreign purchasers. I think everybody hopes that they're going to win Tats Lotto and sell out to some uninformed or dumb foreign purchaser. I'd have to say very few of them exist, but not in my experience in any event. If you are lucky enough to run into one in a taxi or at the airport, grab hold of them with both hands, handcuff them, get them to sign the cheque and be on your merry way, that's great. Um, there's not as much dumb money around or dumb capital as what you think. Um, I think the thing that you really need to ask yourself if you're a vendor is does your property fit their investment profile? And if it doesn't, don't waste your time talking to uh, an international real estate agency. Go and talk to your local bloke. Um, it's very hard to, to paint something up and put lipstick on the pig if, if your property just doesn't fit their investment thematic. Australian position to service regional demand. Um, we've got a lovely little map there that our guys produced, which is fantastic. It shows all of our ports and it shows all the commodities we produce. And to Philippa's point, it demonstrates that we can grow just about anything we want to grow and uh, and there in the opportunity lies we're obviously a net exporter we can export a whole lot more uh, if we take the opportunity to bring that money in so australia has a number of distinct advantages it's obviously located geographically to service the largest developing markets in the world today and when we talk about developing markets we're not just talking about population we're talking about what's happening demographically to that population uh, and their increased wealth which is going to drive their increased consumption uh, we've got a lot of scope to enhance our production base and con convert unproductive land to productive land. And we've probably got as much opportunity as any country in the world to do that, give, particularly given our water resources. And it's good to see that uh, as, a, as a country we're starting to have a, a serious and mature conversation about whether or not we can activate more developments in the north, what we can do in terms of uh, food bowl revitalisation uh, to use our resources more efficiently. Uh, we're an innovative leader in farming and production technology. Uh, we've got low competition for broad acre areas, so we don't have a huge population base. You know, one of the things that confront uh, the guys in California, by way of example, is urban encroachment, not just on the physical uh, land and the arable land that they produce on, but more particularly on their water resource. So, so many of the urban water authorities in, uh, in, uh, in and around California actually own water that's presently used for irrigated agriculture. And the reason they own it is because they want to make sure that they can, uh, in the hierarchy of needs, um, fulfil people's requirement for drinking water uh, over and above their requirement to um, receive food and fibre, if you like, locally. So um, one, of the, one of the big issues that they confront and the reason that we're seeing so much money being activated out of um, California to come and look at almonds by way of example is that people are concerned about whether or not they're going to be able to afford to put water on their almond crops going forward given the, urban, the rate of urbanisation of that resource. We're perceived as a clean green producer. We've got sound production processes. We're already a major exporter, as you can see on that map. We've got plenty of ports. Um, we could do with better infrastructure all the time, obviously. We've got stable government and laws. And on the map, you know, this will be obvious to everybody, you know, we're nice and close to uh, those emerging Asian markets. One of the issues that I've got a difficulty with is people thinking that uh, all of this is going to be driven by population. So in terms of lives, lives and statistics or whatever we were talking about before, I'll go through some as I understand them. World population is expected to increase from 2012 from 7.1 billion to 9.6 billion uh, to 2050. Our own population though is only expected to increase by about 600 million and you'll see on some slides in a moment, yeah, a lot of that's going to come from India and Malaysia. Uh, I think people think that uh, you know, still population growth in China and other places is going to drive things going forward. I don't think they're the facts. Um, in fact, you'll see Japan's population, because of their ageing, is likely to decline by 25% over that period of time, if you, if you extrapolate out what their birth rate's doing relative to their ageing population. And China, because of the one-child policy, is expected to maintain population size. I think the graph's instructive. If you look who the winners and losers are, depending on your view of the world, uh, in terms of population growth, uh, the important ones for us are probably Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, perhaps the Philippines and certainly India. Um, in terms of where all that 
inbound capital, where that foreign capital is being invested, I thought the slide that Philippa put up was really good. Uh, if you look at the population growth in Africa, from now to 2050, that's expected to go up 120%. And what, what's really interesting, again, is, again, if you look at the map, well, I wish I had your map, Philippa. But again, if you have, have a look at Philippa's map, again, you look at the countries where, uh, that are drawn a lot of that foreign investment at the moment, uh, the big gap was in West Africa. And one of the most interesting things that I've experienced lately is we've had two of the West African nations uh, come to us as a, as a global company and say, we need some advice on how we can activate um, some agricultural uh, businesses or some agricultural investment uh, and what commodities we should be targeting. Um, and so I'll be talking to Philip about that later because I reckon there's a big opportunity for Cargill there. Um, in terms of our, uh, our foreign exchange rate, we've obviously been through a period of time since probably 2006 where our currency has been above par, certainly above where it's been for a long period of time. Uh, when we prepared this presentation um, a couple of months ago, I think all the pundits were suggesting that we were going to go back to, uh, or trending back towards, you know, what would have been our usual sort of exchange rate. It's remained stubbornly high, and that remains a big, uh, that remains a big issue for us, I think, going forward. Um, the two reasons are, not only for those who are already invested here in terms of what they're going to receive for their commodity, but in my world, more importantly, what the risks are viewed as from the foreign investors in investing in Australia. Those that are 100% equity investors that aren't able to borrow locally to hedge their to hedge their investment. So borrowing locally gives you a, a currency hedge. Those that, that don't borrow, only borrow lightly, uh, are really downgrading us and seeking higher yields. They're seeking a higher face yield to come and invest. Um, and if I was to use um, uh, you know a current campaign, we're, we're selling all of the Ingham real estate assets on a sale and a lease back at the moment. One of the things we've confronted there is it's very hard to get people to a foreign investor to come under 8% as a face yield, and this is a purely passive investment, on a 20-year triple net lease because they're actually factoring in uh, what they think will be a further decline in our exchange rate going forward, which erodes value for them. So the quicker we can get our exchange rate debt back down, I think the quicker we'll activate more of that foreign investment. Um, we started to get a lot of inquiry uh, when it looked like it was going under 90 cents. Every time it gets back to 90 cents, that inquiry disappears again. So um, that'll be an interesting journey over the next six to 12 months. Composition of global agricultural output, permanent meadows and pastures versus permanent crops versus arable land. What's interesting is that since 1961 to 2011, the amount of arable lands basically stayed consistent, but over that same period of time, Europe lost 25% of its arable land. So I think that what that's demonstrating is that um, where it can be, and most of the impediments are geopolitical, um, where it can be, there is an opportunity to bring more arable land in, um, but we're not seeing an increase in arable land over time because of increasing urbanisation. That's a concern. There obviously are countries that are limited, but the great thing about Australia is we're less limited. I thought this was an instructive graph as well. At the same time that, that arable land stayed largely, stayed largely consistent and permanent meadows and crops have stayed largely consistent, uh, you're seeing a significant increase in permanent plantings. So vineyards, those edible nuts we were talking about before, orchards, those sorts of things, uh, significant increase in a proportional sense over time. And one of the interesting things when you're talking to these institutional investors that are coming into uh, places like the Riverina at the moment to invest in either pastoral lands or irrigated lands for cotton, is they're actually thinking going forward, is the land also suitable for horticulture? I think that's an important point to make as well. That they're taking actually a long-term view and thinking about land use change over time. Now, our Prime Minister-elect quoted on the 16th of September said, Australia welcomes foreign investment, but it's got to be the right foreign investment in our national interest. We can't build walls against the world. Now, the rhetoric's great. Um, I was lucky enough to go to Shanghai last year with uh, our Premier, Dennis Napthlin, and Andrew Robb, the Minister for Trade. Uh, all the things that were said there were fabulous as well, but sadly, um, the investors get those messages when we put them out there and when our politicians go and visit. Uh, when, when they come here or when they get on the Google machine, which we can all do nowadays, or when they ask for the media releases, they still see a lot of negativity. So as I started, um, I would just reiterate, we really need to make sure we're making a conscious decision to say that we do welcome the investment if we want it, if we want to take advantage of it. My, my great concern, so this is not a CBR review, this is a Danny Thomas view, 
my great concern that it, in an environment where we're up to about $67 billion in debt in a market that has a total value of about $260 billion, and I think as John or somebody said, a whole lot of that $260 billion will be hobby farms and things that's not particularly productive. If we don't take this opportunity while this money's sloshing around the place uh, to grab hold of it, it could be a genuine lost opportunity and other countries will be the benefit of, uh, beneficiaries of that. Well, I think that's the rest of my... Uh, well, I think we might end it there, actually. Right. Um, what we might do now is... Um, we could take a couple of questions for Danny and then we might do this bit of, bit of a panel with the Q&A. So I'll take a couple of questions now. If anyone's got a question of Danny. Oh, geez, here we go. Did we, I didn't one see from, the One from the speaker. One from the speaker. Oh. Watch out. Uh, earlier on you talked about the amount of foreign investment going into New Zealand. Yep. Uh, well, what's your view on that? Do you think Got to make sure I answer the question. Um, put it, yeah, no, fair enough. Fifty billion dollars in debt in New Zealand against a, a seventy billion dollars debt. I'd say sixty-seven. Yep, sixty-seven billion dollars in Australia versus a what I said was a total asset value of say two hundred and sixty billion in New Zealand. Fifty billion dollars debt against a total asset value of one hundred and eighty billion. They're the statistics that, that we use. Um, I hope they're right. Um, one of, one of the things I think they did, particularly in relation to the dairy industry, and you've only got to see, um, you know, the strength of Fronterra, Fronterra to that economy. I mean, it changes the exchange rate in New Zealand if they have a, a little wobble um, in terms of their relationships with China or powder or whatever else. They went through a transformative process and they took all their bad medicine about 10 years ago. There was consolidation. Um, uh, I, I think they did a very, very good job of that. And I think that's something that we're probably going through now. Now, that's, that's not a real estate thing, so I don't want to talk authoritatively about that because I can't. But uh, in terms of the real estate market in New Zealand, one of my great concerns is the physical amount of debt in there relative to not just their asset value but what they produce. Um, I'd have to say the banks that have the exposures there are identical to the banks that have the exposures here. They're just as concerned about their exposures in New Zealand as they are in Australia. But on a pound-for-pound pound basis, the physical amount of corporate investment in an industry like dairy farming in New Zealand is significantly higher, and it continues to draw it probably for two reasons. One's obviously the return, so they've done such a good job of, of um, delivering more of that to the farm gate. Uh, but the other reason is, you know, it's an easier and more bankable and less volatile climactic environment as well as a financial environment. So the instos feel much more comfortable going and investing there than what they do in Australia. The third plank to that, and one probably begets the other, is management. You know, they, they feel more comfortable uh, that they can get management, whether it's their country managers or whether it's the, the guys on the ground. And frankly, I think they're just well ahead of us in terms of being able to draw that money in. One more question. Oh, there was a question. Yeah, I um, basically, you said Probably a question better asked of John than me. He obviously um, incentivises them by paying them a lot of money. I don't know if that was lost on you before. <laughs> um, but I think the other thing these guys are doing is, you know, they're employing Australian managers, um, they're em employing Australian advisors, and those guys are saying to them, you know, you've got an obligation to uh, uh, to provide some money to, you know, 
groups like Marcus Oldham to put some scholarship money up and whatever else and to grow some of your own. Um, if I was to use us as an example, which is a little bit left of centre, you know, CBRE is listed on the New York Stock Exchange, a uh, massive corporate, but we've, we've taken the view at a local level as Australians that we need to make sure that we invest not just with our universities, not necessarily through scholarships, but we train, what is it, Tim, seven or eight young people at the present time who are unqualified, so out of a group of 40 staff across Australia and New Zealand, we've got seven, and eight, seven or eight apprentices, if you like, trainees. And I think you'll find that these companies will do the same. You know, they, they know that there's there's a problem, and that a lot of their managers at the moment are aged. And the way they'll do that is they'll have the traditional jackaroo type thing. They'll put some money into the training organisations, and and through people like John who are involved at, at an industry level, they'll make sure that they draw some money from them uh, for training as well. I think you're actually more likely. Cargill's a great example. I think you're more likely to get money from those guys that have you know, a greater uh, social awareness than you are from probably some of the smaller farmer groups that are otherwise strange, you know? Well, let's put our hands together and thank Danny for his presentation. <laughs> now, what, what I'd like to do now is ask the presenters to come up and they'll be um, open for a Q&A session. I'll give you a couple of minutes to stand up and stretch your legs whilst we're just making sure we don't get organised with it and then um, open up for a few more questions or discussion. 